Hello, and welcome to the Science of Terra Genesis. Episode 6, Water. Hey folks, this is Alexander Wynn, founder of Edgeworks Entertainment and creator of Terra Genesis. Just a reminder before we get started today, in a few weeks we're going to be doing our first Q&A episode, in which I'll be answering questions sent in by you, the listeners. You can ask about the game, about the podcast, about the science of terraforming or space exploration, about my feelings on the relative merits of Star Trek versus Star Wars, anything you want. So if you've got a question you'd like to be included, send it over to info at edgeworksentertainment.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. And one more note, I'm experimenting with doing longer episodes with extra information and more detail, based on feedback from listeners who said they'd like a deeper dive into some of the concepts we're discussing. If everyone listening to this took just a few seconds to leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts, and tell us what you think of the show, what you'd like to see in the future, or any other thoughts you have, it would be a huge help. We're a small company of only five full-time employees, and this is our first podcast of what will hopefully be many more. So we're reading every piece of feedback we get, and we really appreciate your input. Please leave us a review. It really does help. All right, so over the last three episodes, we've discussed three of the four major terraforming metrics, temperature, pressure, and oxygen. Today, we're going to be talking about the fourth and final major element in making a habitable world liquid water. Water is perhaps the most famous requirement for life, and the one that humans have spent the most time worrying about in our own history. Atmospheric pressure was never a life-and-death concern until the 19th century with the advent of serious underwater diving operations, and oxygen levels have only mattered to people who were buried alive. Surface temperature has been known to threaten the lives of anyone in a particularly cold region of the Earth, at least without the proper shelter and clothing, but access to clean and drinkable water is still a daily concern for hundreds of millions of people, and has been since the beginning of human history. In fact, a 2010 study found that 3.4 billion people live in areas that are critically water insecure, and as much as 80% of Earth's population, over 6 billion people, are living in areas that are not totally water secure. But what does water security even mean? Well, the UN defines water security as the capacity of a population to safeguard sustainable access to adequate quantities of and acceptable quality of water for sustaining livelihoods, human well-being, and socioeconomic development, for ensuring protection against waterborne pollution and water-related disasters, and for preserving ecosystems in a climate of peace and political stability. That is an interestingly complex definition. Water security isn't just a matter of turning on your faucet and having something come out. Rather, it means having enough water of acceptable quality, not just for humans, but to sustain food growth and the economy, to avoid water-based diseases, and to support the ecosystem, all without putting undue stress on the political fabric of the region. This definition could have been handwritten by a terraformer. It's not enough just to have H2O nearby. You need it to be drinkable, usable, and critically, you need enough of it to keep the planet alive and society functioning. Nowhere is that more clear than on a previously dead planet that you're trying to start a civilization on and bring to life. But first, let's start with the basics. What even is water? Well, water is a chemical compound formed when two hydrogen atoms combine with one oxygen atom, hence the chemical designation H2O. It can also be called dihydrogen monoxide, which is literally just Latin for two hydrogens and one oxygen, but makes for hilarious comedy when you use it to scare people because they aren't familiar with that term. Did you know that every single person who has consumed dihydrogen monoxide has either already died or is expected to die within a few decades? It's true. You can look it up. And yet the government is doing nothing to stop people from being exposed to dihydrogen monoxide. Ugh. Such a tragedy. While we're talking about etymology, the word hydrogen is actually a reference to that element's role in making water. Hydrogen gas was first artificially produced in the early 16th century as part of the output of various chemical reactions, but Henry Cavendish in the 1770s was the first person to separate hydrogen and identify it on its own. 
He quickly realized that burning it produces water when hydrogen molecules combine with the natural oxygen in the air. He gave this substance the Greek name hydrogen, which literally means water maker. The word water itself is incredibly old. It's a well-known trend in linguistics that the more important, fundamental, or common something is in daily life, the more durable that word will be over time as the language evolves. Words like carriage or pillow may be relatively recent creations, to say nothing of airplane and computer, but the word water can be traced back from modern English to Middle and then Old English through Proto-Germanic and eventually all the way back to Proto-Indo-European. That reconstructed mother language was spoken nearly 7,000 years ago and eventually gave rise to a massive roster of languages, including Spanish, English, Portuguese, Hindi, Urdu, Bengali, Russian, Punjabi, German, Persian, French, Italian, Marathi, Latin, Ancient Greek, Hittite, Sanskrit, and hundreds more. The word water is so fundamental to human daily experience that it is cognate, meaning it shares a linguistic root, with words like, and please forgive my pronunciation, voda in Russian, udra in Sanskrit, wato in Gothic, waitar in Hittite, hudor in Ancient Greek, vasser in German, and utur in Latin. The word water is practically unchanged in languages stretching from Ireland to India. If you walked up to a stranger near the Caspian Sea 7,000 years ago and asked for waitor or wodur, they'd likely know exactly what you meant. Think about that for a minute and tell me it isn't the coolest thing you've heard all friggin' day. Oh, did I not mention that in addition to being a science nerd, I'm also a deep and passionate linguistics nerd? Yeah, strap in folks, it only gets geekier from here. 71% of Earth's surface is covered in water ranging from just a few inches deep to over 11 kilometers deep in the Mariana Trench, the deepest spot on Earth. Many scientists believe that most of that water is actually extraterrestrial in origin. It came raining down in comets and meteors as the Earth was forming. The surface of the early Earth was under a constant barrage of impacts from space, each of which brought a small amount of water along with it. Even today, many comets are partially or even mostly made of water ice, and back then there would have been trillions of them. More water was probably released as the planet cooled, slowly migrating up from the planet's interior through surface cracks and volcanoes. Over billions of years, that water built up the oceans, rivers, lakes, and glaciers that still exist today. Of course, it wouldn't have looked at all like it does today. The Earth would have been incredibly hot back then, kept partially or completely molten from constant impacts and internal radiation, along with a suffocatingly thick atmosphere of carbon dioxide. Even as it cooled, the surface would have been a black and red hellscape of igneous volcanic rock, more resembling the black plains of Mordor than the planet we know today. The water would have existed largely as vapor, a chokingly thick humidity on the surface of the boiling hot world. Eventually, though, the planet did begin to cool, and all that vapor began to fall to the surface. It eventually became a planet-wide rainstorm that would rain for millions and millions and millions of years. By about four billion years ago, almost the entire surface of the Earth was covered in water. How do we know? Because geology rocks. More than 90% of volcanic rock on Earth is what's called basalt, or basaltic rock. This type of rock can come in many different variations, but one in particular is known as pillow lavas. They have a distinct puffy shape, and they only form when lava cools underwater. Everywhere geologists look on Earth, the rocks from four billion years ago are pillow lavas. So we can conclude that by that time, there were already deep oceans covering the planet. If you could travel back to that point in time, just half a billion years after the Earth was formed, it would have seemed like an alien landscape. The oceans were iron-rich, making them a deep olive-green color, and the entire planet's temperature hovered just under the boiling point. 
The thick oceans punished the few small volcanic islands that dared to break the surface, eroding them down into dust before they could ever grow into anything more. But a resurgence of undersea volcanism finally began to change that. Giant cracks in the Earth's crust allowed superheated water to pour down into the molten basaltic lava to produce a new type of rock called granite. Granite was simultaneously tougher than basaltic rock, so it could withstand the erosion of the oceans, but also significantly lighter than basaltic rock. In fact, the difference in density between granite and basalt is greater than the difference in density between water and air. The new granitic rock literally floated to the top of the ocean's crust, where it accumulated more and more over millions of years. These slowly growing granite deposits formed the cores of Earth's new land masses, the continents. And it was all thanks to the presence of water. I'm going to resist the urge to take you on a complete tour of Earth's geological history, so we'll wrap this up, but not before connecting it back to another history lesson from an earlier episode. Remember the cyanobacteria from our discussion last week about oxygen? They were the first life forms to begin photosynthesis, and who eventually gave us our oxygen-rich atmosphere. Well, those cyanobacteria would never have been able to do their thing without the rise of granite. These proto-continents lifted early life up from the deep ocean floor, where they had been getting thermal and chemical energy from dark volcanic vents, and raised them up into shallow and sun-drenched coastlines. Once there, bathed in sunlight and massaged by the tides, the cyanobacteria could begin utilizing that energy and transforming the atmosphere. That's what's so exciting about science. Everything is connected, and seemingly disparate branches of study end up being critical to each other's development. Water allowed for the development of life, and also the development of granite continents. And then granite allowed for life to begin photosynthesizing. And photosynthesis ended up transforming the atmosphere, which dramatically altered the types of organisms that could survive. And on and on and on. So that's the history of water on Earth. From meteor impacts to superheated clouds, from a planetary rainstorm into olive green oceans, and finally, to the creation of the continents and the origins of life. But what about water outside of Earth? Many people tend to believe that water is never found outside of our blue planet, and I've even heard people arguing that space exploration and the hominization of other planets is impossible because we'd have to bring all our water with us. It's a reasonable misunderstanding to have, since scientists and newspapers are always talking about the search for water. But there's an important distinction that they're missing. Liquid surface water is vanishingly rare beyond Earth's orbit. But water ice is everywhere. Our solar system is a desert, but on the model of Antarctica, not the Sahara. If you've got enough time and energy to melt it, there's more water than you will ever be able to use. The first two planets in our solar system, Mercury and Venus, are largely without water. A few patches have been found in the shadows of craters on Mercury, shielded from the sun, but not a ton. Venus is thought to have had water once, and in fact was very much like Earth, but a lack of a magnetosphere combined with a runaway greenhouse effect that turned it into the hellscape it currently is would have destroyed any water long ago. Mars is a little more promising, with significant ice deposits all over the planet, and even the occasional liquid water creating new runoff channels on the surface. Mars has an average surface temperature of a frigid negative 55 degrees Celsius, or negative 67 degrees Fahrenheit, but it can experience quite warm summer days. One afternoon in 2012, it even reached 20 degrees Celsius, or about 68 degrees Fahrenheit, according to thermal sensors on the Curiosity rover. That's not just liquid water warm, that's t-shirt and flip-flops warm, if it weren't for, you know, the deadly vacuum, lack of oxygen, and high radiation. The asteroid belt has a bunch of water ice in the same dirty snowballs that once helped create Earth's oceans, but the real mother load is in the moons of the gas giants. Europa is the most famous, where Jupiter's intense gravity provides enough energy to keep a permanent liquid water ocean under miles and miles of surface ice. You can think of it like working a piece of gum or rubber to warm it up 
which in turn makes it more flexible. Jupiter's gravity massages Europa's interior to keep it fluid. And there are hundreds of moons orbiting Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, many of which are largely composed of water ice, to say nothing of asteroids and comets and Saturn's rings and more. As soon as humanity builds enough infrastructure to start moving material around the solar system, future terraformers will have all the water they could ever, ever need. We already touched on the triple point of water in our discussion of atmospheric pressure and how pressure helps define the boiling and freezing points of water. Increase or decrease the atmospheric pressure of a world, and water might freeze at 3 or negative 5 degrees Celsius, or boil at 97 or 103. The more you alter the atmosphere, the more the numbers will change. The term triple point refers to the precise combination of pressure and temperature at which water vapor, liquid water, and water ice can all exist simultaneously. That's about zero degrees Celsius and 611 pascals of pressure. If that number sounds familiar, it's because that happens to be almost the exact air pressure on the surface of Mars. In fact, the Mariner 9 mission to Mars used the triple point of water as a way to gauge elevation, since it didn't have any sea level to measure by. Of course, there's a lot more to the story of water than where you can find it. Just like we discovered last week with oxygen and atmospheric composition, the simple existence of water on Earth isn't nearly the whole story. Most obviously, anyone who has ever visited the ocean knows the distinction between salt water and fresh water. Earth's oceans have a salinity, or salt content, of about 3.5%. That means for every kilogram of water, there are about 35 grams of sodium and chloride ions. The presence of this salt has a number of effects, from increasing the density of the water to lowering its freezing point and making it not drinkable by humans. And of course, there are millions of plant, algae, microbe, and animal species who require salt water to survive, and who would quickly die if you placed them in freshwater sources like rivers, lakes, or a freshwater swamp. Salt water has several gradations based on the amount of salt content. Seawater falls into the second highest concentration section, called saline water, which has 3 to 5% salinity. Above that is briny water, with 5% or higher. Slightly less salty than seawater is brackish water, which contains 0.05 to 3% salt content. And below that is fresh water, with 0 to 0.05%. Altering the salinity of our oceans can have dramatic changes to the planet, from killing off species like corals, which have very narrow environmental requirements, to altering the flow of oceanic currents, which can affect the climate of the entire world. Less commonly understood is the pH scale, which is used to measure how acidic or basic a chemical is. The pH scale is a bizarre and counterintuitive thing, and there's a ton of weird chemistry math that goes into using it, but the short version is that it's a scale from 0 to 14, with 7 being the neutral middle ground. It measures the concentration of hydrogen ions in the water. And just because scientists like to make life miserable for poor, confused chemistry students, the pH scale is both logarithmic and inverted. A lower pH indicates a higher concentration of hydrogen ions. Or as one description helpfully put it, the formula for calculating pH, quote, approximates the negative of the base 10 logarithm of the molar concentration of hydrogen ions in the solution. But we've already spent enough time talking about foreign languages for one episode, so let's move on. There are two more important factors to know about when considering water's role in a planetary environment. The first is its role in the hydrosphere. Water is constantly changing and moving on Earth, and that process is called the water cycle. Just like air is contained within the atmosphere, and the planet's magnetic field makes up the magnetosphere, Earth has a hydrosphere, which is a term we use to describe all the water on our planet's surface, from rain clouds to oceans and from swamps to snow. Water is constantly being recycled and redistributed across Earth's surface, evaporating from the ocean's surface to rain down on the land, flowing down through rivers into lakes only to be consumed by animals and breathed back out into the air, condensing on a leaf, and then flowing back into the ocean, splitting apart and recombining in an infinite reshuffling. 
Many school kids have wondered aloud if their morning glass of milk contains at least one water molecule drunk by Julius Caesar or Genghis Khan. After millennia of cycling through the hydrosphere, the answer is that it's almost statistically impossible that it doesn't. The topic of the hydrosphere alone could fill several hour-long episodes, but suffice it to say that it is an intricate and complex process that has far-ranging and often difficult to predict effects on the planetary environment. Designing one from scratch on a terraformed planet will require the focused work of generations of scientists and could be a make-or-break feature in the success of a terraforming project. The other thing to know about water is how it is used in the biological functions of humans and other life forms. Again, this topic could support its own entire podcast network and basically encompasses all the fields of both biology and medicine. But in brief, the human body is about 60% water. According to the Journal of Biological Chemistry, your brain and heart are composed of 73% water, your lungs are about 83% water, your skin is 64% water, your muscles and kidneys are 79%, and even your bones are 31% composed of water. Adult humans require 2-3 to liters of water every 24 hours, and without it, will die in just a few days. Water transports vital chemicals throughout the body, keeps our cells alive, regulates our temperature through perspiration and respiration, softens impacts, helps digest food, lubricates joints, dilutes and helps excrete waste, and a thousand other critical things as you go about your day. Life first evolved in the oceans, and we literally carry little pieces of the ocean with us all the time, suspending our organs and suffusing our bodies with salt water, even as we walk upright through the dry air. Water is essential to life, and as such, it is the last essential step in any terraforming effort. Which brings us back to Terragenesis. For ease of discussion in game, we measure your water levels in centimeters of depth, rather than trying to calculate the total volume of water required by your world's unique topography. It takes a lot more water to flood a broad plain than a narrow gorge, but in Terragenesis, we don't bother with that. 10 centimeters of water is 10 centimeters of water. And as with all the other three key metrics, heat, pressure, and oxygen, we have three facilities in-game for increasing your water levels and three for decreasing them. If your goal is to increase your sea level, you can start with a cloud seeder. This is a real process used on Earth right now, which involves distributing chemicals into the upper atmosphere, which encourage the growth of clouds and eventually the precipitation of rain. It can't create new water, but it can help jumpstart the local hydrosphere and get hidden water sources out into circulation. Next up, an aquifer network involves locating and tapping sources of underground water, like subterranean lakes and glaciers, and pumping that water up onto the surface. Finally, the comet sling will really get your oceans growing quickly, recreating the formation of Earth's oceans by grabbing comets and asteroids from space and sending them careening through the upper atmosphere, releasing their water onto the surface. The trick there, of course, is to aim very very carefully. No one wants an extra 500 liters of water at the expense of their house being destroyed by an orbital strike. If you've accidentally flooded your world, and what Terragenesis player hasn't at some point, you'll likely need to start researching a geocistern. This is essentially a really huge cave into which water can be pumped and then sealed off, effectively removing it from the planetary hydrosphere. Better yet is an electrolysis plant, which uses electricity to split the H2 from the O, producing breathable oxygen while lowering the sea level over time. If you need to work even faster, try building a few ice launchers. These facilities work like meteors in reverse, essentially loading small glaciers into giant rail guns and then launching them off the surface of the planet entirely. Of course, in real life, there will be a million different techniques and tools for increasing or decreasing the sea level of a planet as it is being terraformed, most of which will be totally unimaginable to us today. But one thing is undeniable. After a planet's temperature, atmospheric pressure, and oxygen levels have been mastered, its hydrosphere will be the last major hurdle in allowing it to support a complex ecosystem and eventually human life. 
Thank you for listening to this week's episode of The Science of Terragenesis. Be sure to send in your questions to info at edgeworksentertainment.com. That's info at edgeworksentertainment.com. Terragenesis and The Science of Terragenesis podcast are productions of Edgeworks Entertainment, an independent media company dedicated to creating unique and intricate worlds for people to explore. Be sure to subscribe for new episodes, and you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, and Discord at Terragenesis Game, on Twitter at twitter.com slash settle the stars, and on YouTube at youtube.com slash Edgeworks Entertainment. You can also check us out at edgeworksentertainment.com and terragenesisgame.com. And don't forget to leave a review for the podcast. It really does help. And if you haven't played it yet, be sure to check out the indie terraforming game Terragenesis, which is a free download on iOS, Android, and the Microsoft Store. In the meantime, I'm your host, Alexander Wynn, saying thanks for listening, and as always, happy terraforming.